Testing one, two, three, four. Face mounting test. One, two, three, four. I'm going to add live. one more thing. Okay, hopefully uh, people are going to keep logging on. We've got 70-something uh, members, and we're going to go ahead and get started, though. I think I know most everybody, hopefully. I'm Chet Powell. I'm the director of the Georgia Wildlife Rescue Association. And uh, if you were with us for the previous two attempts, um, of this class, then all I can do is apologize because that was a complete disaster. We were with another company. I'm not going to even say the name. We don't want to get sued. But, um, it was a it was a disaster. But uh, Dale Hall and I have been working on this, and it's actually something we came up with. Dale does a program called Deep Dixie Racing, um, and I went out and watched it last week and was super impressed. So I think we've got it figured out. We hope. And uh, as I told you at the beginning of, of the previous classes, if you were in those, uh, this is the introduction to wildlife rescue. And this, this one is boring. I'll go ahead and tell you as far as, you're not gonna see a lot of cuddly animals. We've got some video to show you of some cool stuff, uh, including some surgery on a, a deer. Um, one of the things we wanted to do is, as volunteers, most of the time, what you're gonna do is transport animals um, to a rehabber from the location where it was caught. Sometimes you'll be the one to go out and, and, and have to retrieve the animals. A lot of times they'll already have it boxed or, and I guess I need to turn my phone down. See, if we were in the theater, I would have got a warning to do that. But um, you will have the opportunity to work with some rehabbers, especially if you have one close to you. And most of them will, will be glad to, to train you and, and work with you. Um, we we have uh, several videos to show you to show you kind of what happens afterwards both with mammals and then we have something from the georgia sea turtle center this program will be archived so if you want to go back and look at it later 
and uh, we're, we're going to add more documents as we go tonight. And we're going to show you a little PowerPoint presentation in a few minutes, kind of let you know how we got started. Incidentally, we're uh, five years old in about three or four more days. And I guess we could go ahead and do that uh, to start with. And before you start that, Dale, let me let me explain um, the way that this has worked previously. Uh, there was no Georgia Wildlife Rescue Association. And in Georgia, all of the wildlife rehabbers are required to be licensed by the state. And if they're federally listed, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And you'd be surprised how many animals are. Um, the problem is um, most of these rehabbers are few and far between, and they don't have the time to go out and pick up an animal and sometimes they can meet someone, but very often they can't. And uh, so we started thinking about uh, ways that we could help fill in some of these gaps. Right. Okay, what was that? My phone. Okay, now turn yours down. <laughs> and incidentally, uh, if I hope that background noise is not too bad. We found out we're close to an out elevator shaft, so <laughs> not the best design in the world for this building. But uh, why don't we do that first? Why don't we go look at this video? What happened was in 2010, of course, everybody knows what happened if you're a wildlife person or, or fisherman or love the ocean on April uh, 20th, 2010 is when Deepwater Horizon um, exploded and caught fire. And it took uh, about three days. I should be able to see it here, right? About a minute behind, yeah, um, it took about three days before uh, we uh, before the thing sunk. All right, what you're seeing there on the right, the right photo is you guys can come up here if you want to. The right photo, the I'm sorry, the left photo is the Deepwater Horizon rig as it was being towed to the location where it eventually sank. The picture on the right is just after it was anchored. Uh, where it, where it would eventually sink. And that gives you the, the location there. It was called the Mississippi Canyon um, and tells you, of course, what time the explosion occurred. And all this is basically telling you where we come from because uh, this is how we became organized by working in, uh, in the Gulf, believe it or not. Um, and if you just think back, that's what we all were watching the, on April the 21st, the next morning. Um, and uh, I, I guess, you know, everybody needs to remember 11 people died was, was uh, the tragedy that came out of that and then the environmental tra tragedy also. And I suppose that is the right way. Um, I'm seeing, I guess I can't see it from here. Okay, that's a night view. And I'm gonna walk you through some things. What happened was when we heard about the disaster those of us here in Georgia, let me back up. This is boom operations. This was the first attempt to, before the oil hit the shore, they started these uh, boom operations, the orange things you see there. And they used local fishermen, uh, that boat, the unreal in the bottom right corner kind of was ironic to me. The booms were partial, uh, a partial attempt. And the second thing they did was they tried to burn the oil off. And that photo there, you need to get an idea of the scale of that. Those are ships, not fishing boats. That's a Coast Guard cutter in the bottom right corner. Um, and that was a joke. This was a joke, too, the skimming operations. I went out on some of these ships and watched this. Um, the skimming operations, they basically use booms, and they would circle around and trap the oil, use hoses to push it in the corner, and then you see those three orange cones that's basically a big suction kind of like a shop giant shop vac um my first concern uh about the beaches were we were approaching sea turtle nesting season and and you know there are uh, seven species of turtle sea turtles on the earth five of them are in the gulf all of them are protected and um i you know that was my my concern and uh that's kind of a rough map of the gulf um, and uh, 
I thought the ORID was marked there, but it's, I guess it wasn't. Wait on the next screen. I can't remember what's coming up next. Okay. Um, a lot of people wonder how in the world would I be involved with sea turtles? Well, if you remember when we were at Reed Bingham State Park, that's Jennifer Glover in that top center picture. Uh, Jennifer Glover and I started a program that's never been done in Georgia. It was uh, a head start program for, for gopher tortoise eggs. The gopher tortoises are um, threatened in Georgia and protected. And they're very similar. To, these are sea turtle eggs. That, in fact, what you're looking at now is that's the first sea turtle nest that was uh, dug up and saved. And uh, I'm trying to figure out where I'm standing, but I'm there somewhere. <laughs> Um, this was one of the nests, first nests that I got to actually remove. Um, and that's Joe, can't think of his last name, National Park Service. What, what our proposal was, what happened was on May the 28th, which two days from now, May the 28th in 2010, um, I asked a question, there's more sea turtle legs being removed. I was at a news conference and I kind of wasn't really supposed to be there probably. And I asked a question for, for uh, to Rear Admiral Mary Landry, and she was at that time the person who was in charge of everything, all the operations there. And I asked her what the plans were for sea turtles. And at that time, they I was shocked to learn there were no plans. And I called uh, several people, uh, friends, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and some other folks, uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife, and you know that everybody was concerned but there was no plan so we started talking about the relocation plan um i'll come back to that i better catch up here these are u.s fish and wildlife capture teams and after we got the turtle program going what we would do is uh, you see her taking the coordinates for a call a fisherman called in a, a, a wildlife rescue we got mostly birds we got some sea turtles uh, this is a northern gannet i believe and this shows the whole process. Uh, we're walking, looking for it. Usually the, all the birds would fly and the injured bird is dead on the, or not dead, but on the ground, it can't fly. The bottom left is the three different solutions it goes through to be cleaned. Some of these pictures I took, this was really, really hard to deal with. Now you gotta remember, this is a bunch of people from Georgia who just went down to help. We all were either rangers or biologists, veterinarians, uh, there were some rehabbers. Some people had no experience with animals, they just wanted to help. So they had to go through a training process. And we're going to uh, talk about how you can be ready in case something like this happens again, especially along the Georgia coast. We had something happen in Turner County and we may show you some video of that uh, a little bit later. Um, I love these two pictures. These are two that were fully rehabbed and later released. It's a gannet on the left and uh, obviously a pelican on the right. Pelicans, you had to be super careful. She's wearing eye protective gear there and gloves. And and the best part was the releases. And I think... Uh, Some of these were longer than others. <laughs> okay, uh, how do we get from there to here? And I think you can go ahead and stop that, Dale. And what happened was that, first of all, we stayed, most of us stayed in Florida for uh, months. I stayed went back and forth off and on for almost a year. And uh, still go down periodically to work on uh, certain teams. But what happened was when we got through and got finished, um, well, even before that, about five of us met in Albany and we were concerned about what to do to help speed things up. Everything seemed to be going very slow to us uh, down in the Gulf. The materials were not getting there quick enough. So a bunch of people in Georgia got together and we started a materials drive. The main thing we wanted to get first was Dawn dishwashing liquid. We wanted to get uh, lots of rags and we had, we had a list and Harvey's 
supermarket chain worked with us and put up a list and we got it on all the no local newspapers, the, the TV channels. And uh, it was so successful that we ended up having to get a warehouse to store everything in. And as a result, all of the people who went to Florida from Georgia, we were probably the only organization that, that went fully prepared with our own equipment, um, you know, almost everything we needed. And we actually supplied some of the uh, rescue centers that were established along the coast with with uh, material until until the government could catch up. Um, so we were ahead a little bit. But uh, what happened was there were about five of us and we started talking about how to organize um, to get equipment and things down there and help and train the people. And then when Deepwater was over, we realized we had this great network of people. And um, we started talking about how to make that beneficial in Georgia. And the most obvious thing was to create a network of volunteers to help out the rehabbers, especially with transports. That was one of the things that we constantly heard. I don't have time to stop feeding babies to go out and pick up one baby when I've got 50 here to feed. So, um, and that made a lot of sense. So we, we did that. We, our first goal was to uh, train volunteers. Um, another thing we wanted to do was establish a way for people to contact us and some social media uh, to report uh, injured and orphaned animals. And then one of the, our other really big goals was to stop the number of what we call kidnappings. A lot of times when people um, are thinking they're rescuing an animal, they're, they're actually taking it out. A, a baby deer is the, a fawn is the biggest example of that. Rabbits too, fledgling birds. Um, there, you know, that, there's a learning process at, of learning to fly. And when those birds are on the ground, a lot of people will just grab them thinking they're hurt. And that's obviously not a good thing if, if they're learning to fly. Um, out of all the calls that we get about injured and orphaned wildlife, probably anywhere from 75 to 80 percent are able to be either we tell them to leave them alone, or in many cases to take them back and put them back. And uh, sometimes that's really hard to convince somebody. Uh, their first thing is that myth that we've all heard, and I heard it my whole life. I, you know, don't touch a baby bird or a baby animal because the mom won't take care of it. Um, that's not true with almost any animal, whether it's a mammal or a bird. And it's certainly not true with birds because birds don't smell. So um, I don't know how that got, uh, that got started. But in most cases, if the animal is not injured or truly orphaned, now if there's a dead doe on the highway and a, a fawn in the ditch, obviously that's an orphan. But uh, um, I don't even know how many uh, calls we've had about fawns, and we're really early in the fawn season. June is the big month for baby deer. So uh, I can't even tell you how many calls we've had where so far we've had really good success in getting them put back. I think uh, the closest uh, deer rehabber to where we're sitting today in Tifton is uh, Stephanie Giddens, and Stephanie's only got two or three right now, and that's that's really good. Um, because that means a lot of them have been left alone or, or put back. Um, I think what we'll do now is uh, hear from a couple of the volunteers from our last class, or maybe three or four. Can we do that, Dale? And we'll, we're going to let you listen to a couple of the volunteers talk about uh, how they got involved. Start off with Angela Pitt. Yeah, that, however. Lorraine and Thomasville. I've picked up on the way back from vacation. Um, I've had some raccoons. I've had possums. I've had um, two fawns. I've been around the woods all my life. I grew up on a farm. Um, I hunted. I fished. I want my kids to be able to enjoy the same things that I did. Um, and I think as as we grow in the new areas, you know, throughout Georgia, we build new neighborhoods, we urbanize the woods, and we do all these things that 
if, if we're not around to save the things that we destroy, then they're not going to be around for us to enjoy in the coming years. So. And our children. Right. And so that's really why I started it. Um, I believe in, you know, conservation. I have always moved turtles off the roadways. I moved snakes off the roadways. And, you know, whatever I can do just to kind of help as we approach on their areas, I, I feel like I should do my, my due justice and try to help them out. So that's really why I got started in it. But I've really enjoyed it. I mean, everything that I've handled has been fun to me. And it's just, you know, it's not. I don't look at it as, you know, being a chore and having to stop what I'm doing to go do something else. You I know, mean, I really have enjoyed doing everything that I've, that I've handled. So it's been fun. If somebody else is looking to get into this, what, what advice would you give them? Mm -hmm. To know more, take notes about everything that you come across. Um, you never know when you're going to have to have it for several hours. You know, I guess whenever I started this, I was thinking, oh, you know, we're going to have something in the car and it's going to go straight to a rehabber. Well, that's not always the case because sometimes rehabbers are full or sometimes the rehabber it's going to might be 200 miles away from you. So I guess if I had any advice that I could give, it would be to to have plenty of materials on hand, um, to learn how to feed each each thing that you might come across, you know, whether it be on the roadside at your house or whether it be something that you're helping out with, because that's the biggest thing that I come across is having to sit down and say, okay, now how much does this little guy get at five grams or, you know, this or that. So, what, What's the most rewarding aspect of this? To, you? to me, it is, to go out to the only rehabber that I've ever visited is actually Lorraine Conklin in Thomasville. But I think to see everything that she does and to know that there's a lot of animals that otherwise would not survive if it had not been for my intervention, whether it be transport or, you know, whatever role I play along the way, just to see the thing get released back into the wild and know that it's going to be able to enjoy its natural habitat, that's very rewarding. So, you would recommend this highly for anybody else who's a like person? Most definitely. If you've ever stopped on the roadside and got out of the car and moved a turtle, or, you know, if, you, if you've ever come across something in the woods and you think, wow, I wish there was something I could do, I wish I knew more, I wish I could help, then this is definitely for you. I'm Brooke Hester, and uh, I've been volunteering for CHIT for about five years, and um, I took the class in Thomasville and in CHIT when they had it a while back. Um, I've been on a lot of calls, anything from owls, uh, phones, raccoons, possums, skunks, anything like that. Um, at any hour of the day, I get called to go get something or transport it to Lorraine or just wherever it needs to go. What responsibilities do you have when you're you're on a call and sometimes a little bit more involved than just transporting it? Yeah, um, you need to make sure you have gloves in the right box to transport it in, where it'll be comfortable. Uh, make sure if it's a baby baby, you need to have a heat pad ready and warm so that they can stay warm. Because some babies can't fluctuate their body heat. What do you enjoy most heat. about this? Um, probably just the fact that I get to help the babies out and just give them a second chance because they wouldn't be able to take care of themselves by themselves. So. Uh, kind of giving them a second chance at life. Has most of your calls been involving babies or has it been injured animals too? Or uh, It's been a little bit of both. Um, I actually had a grown owl that was hit by a car that I got went and got and um, a lot of babies ranging from almost newborn to a couple of months old. Why did you get involved old. in this to start with? Um, I was actually, I was 12 years old and I started, I went to Reed Bingham and I just loved animals so much and they got me started volunteering with the animals and I just really loved it, and there's lots of What good do you see coming out of this for anybody that wants to be involved? Um, you get a hands-on experience with wildlife animals that normally people, some people don't even get to see in their life. Um, it's just really neat to get to experience that. So you would recommend it for anybody that enjoys working with wildlife? Oh yes, any age. It's, fun. it's great at any age. I'm uh, Kip Pittman. I'm Willacoochee, Georgia. I uh, got involved with Georgia Wildlife Rescue through Facebook, found out about them, uh, took the course in March, and um, 
I've volunteered for a few transports. Uh, transported a couple litters of raccoons and uh, a fawn that was injured that unfortunately didn't make it. Uh, there's that aspect of what what's going on. You have to prepare yourself. Uh, no matter what you do, sometimes it's it's not going to be enough. But uh, it's uh, it's a good feeling to be able to help and. Uh, and uh, I've enjoyed it thus far. Uh, I've traveled to Glen County, which is 75 miles from here, to, to pick up a litter of raccoons. I went to uh, Scriven, Georgia, the other night uh, for the injured fawn. Um, you know, sometimes there's not a volunteer close by. And that's one reason they need more folks that are that are interested in helping and. Uh, we can have more people available to, to boot these animals. So it's a good feeling to help. Um, I don't know anybody else that's in the state that's organized and, and trying to, to do this. I know there's some vets involved, and, and uh, but it's mostly just private citizens that volunteer to help. wildlife rescue class in February at Thomasville. Um, I got into this because I really love animals. One day I'm hoping to be a rehabber and I'm figuring this is just the best way to get into it. Um, it's the next best thing to be in a rehabber. Rehabber takes up a lot of time and money and I'm working full time right now so I can't do that. But you know, these injured, injured and orphan animals, they really depend on us to get them to the rehabbers. So that's why I've started doing it, just to pick them up and get them to the what, what type of uh, cases have you been involved in so far? Uh, I have picked up many ponds, um, raccoons, possums, turtles, more birds than I can count, uh, multiple hawks, um, most snake eggs, that was the most interesting one. That was very interesting getting to pick those up. Uh, my son was with me. He was very scared that the snake eggs were going to hatch as we were getting them to chat got to release a bunch of baby possums one time that was that was interesting and we also got to release a turtle that had been rehabbed from the Jeffrey Turtle Center um, and it had gotten hit by a car and they had it for a few weeks and got it all bandaged up fixed up and it was ready to go back to the wild so I got to pick it up and actually release it and got to watch it go back into the river where it came from but what I'm hearing from you not only is it rewarding to you it's educational for your family also oh right? yes my family really enjoys being able to see the animals and get to interact with them and get to see, I mean, what we do. I'm trying to get these baby, baby animals and um, the animals to the rehabbers. Uh, if you were going to recommend this to anybody else, uh, what would you say to them? Oh, it's definitely worth it. Um, class is wonderful. Chet's wonderful. Um, it's, it's a change in pace. Uh, something different like if you're at home just sitting around watching tv before tired of cleaning up your house you get a phone call hey you know this person's got an injured fawn you get to go pick up you know get to see an injured fawn and take it to miss lorraine and thomasville and you get to watch her actually work with this animal see what well she it's does. all volunteer work so we don't have very many people that can do it so during the peak of the baby season i was getting calls every day i think i did 19 calls in 19 days one time and it gets expensive with the gas because it comes directly out of your pocket so it'd be nice if more people got involved and could actually donate to the Wildlife, wildlife Re Rehabilitation Center. Or even spread out the cost. Or of spread it. out the cost of, of doing it for volunteers. So you don't have to do 19 calls in one day. Okay, and obviously Libby's sitting here with me now instead of on the tape. And uh, Libby's was the first one to uh, take and pass her test uh, to take that next step. Now, most people are not going to do that, and we understand that. Um, most of our volunteers do this in their spare time to help when they can, and that's a huge amount of help for rehabbers all over Georgia. But one of the things that we're trying to do 
is um, fill in the gaps in areas where we don't have rehabbers and or where rehabbers are overworked. And South Georgia is certainly one of those places. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. I'll show you something on a, on a map. But I know there are at least uh, four or five other people who either went through the class that Libby did or one of the previous classes. Our first one was in 2012. So um, we've only been having these classes for three years. And out of th those three years, we've already produced some people who are taking that and passing their um, wildlife rehabilitation test so they can take that next step and and become rehabbers and and relieve some of these overworked uh, wildlife rehabilitators like Lorraine Conklin and uh, and some of the others aware up near Atlanta who get slammed constantly. And uh, when did you take your test? A month ago. A month ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, go ahead and brag. You pat how many times did you have to take your test? One time. Which is really unusual. Don't. I, I always tell people, some people say, oh, my God, I didn't pass. And um, I know of very few people who passed that wildlife rehab test the first time. And uh, and it, I think what snags them, do you know what the questions would that would, it's a lot of uh, um, ratio, that kind of stuff. There's it's, a lot of medical questions. Yeah. There's a lot of math. Yeah. And, and the thing that I think that helped Libby is your background. Right. Medical background. Yeah. Um, what? I know you work at the hospital. What do you do? Take x-rays and ultrasounds. Okay. Okay. So, you know, obviously Libby's got a medical background, so that helps. And um, were you good at taking tests in school? Were you was, a nerd? I was a nerd. Okay. Yes. Well, so you, nerds do better too. So, um, Still am. <laughs> <laughs> but, and the great thing about it is now Libby is already helping a couple of other uh, volunteers who were taking that next step and we've got how many rehabbers did you work with you see Lorraine Conklin uh, Roxanne Lorraine Conklin is the only rehabber south of Macon Georgia that can do everything uh, from birds to raptors to rabies RVS you'll hear us talk about RVS or RVS or rabies vector species skunks uh, raccoons um, Foxes, I'm losing it. Yeah, foxes, yeah. And um, so, uh, look, since Lorraine is the only one south of Macon, that means everything from the Atlantic coast to that Alabama line, um, from here, from the Florida line to, to Macon, only has one place to go. And L Lorraine is really stressed right now. She, do you know what she's got as far as not just RVS, but everything? Last I heard, she had 109. I mean that that's nuts. So Lorraine has one person who helps her uh, sometimes, and it's not every single day either. But Lorraine's done this for at least thirty-four, maybe thirty-six years now. She's kind of a legend. She's not kind of. She is a legend um, in the wildlife community. We're getting some questions on here, Chip. Uh, okay. Um, like Jill Howard Church, she says, since we sometimes transport raccoons and may encounter other RVS animals, where can we get pre-exposure rabies shots? relatively cheaply the problem is they're not they're not cheap, cheap. they yeah. charge 700 dollars in her county is what she say yeah. there's that, a series i just checked into that um a few days ago the cheapest that i found was actually in tiff county at the health department it's like 212 dollars a shot and there's a series of three shots yeah so wow. so i don't know if, if jill or if what you're talking about is the total series i would presume i hope um yeah that has to be everything so that's that's about the same then. Not yeah. Much more, yeah. Yeah. Um, I know several people. Uh, I got mine in Cook County. Um, I don't even remember what mine were though. Um, that they were expensive. And, and what we hope to do is, we're not quite there yet. But what we hope to do is, if you are willing to work with RBS species with under the supervision of a rehabber, you're not a rehabber by taking this. We're gonna. Go over some things. Well, in let me read another response to that. Okay. Michelle Grant says, Jill, check with your insurance company and see if they cover it. Mine did, and I had my doctor call in a prescription for them, and my pharmacy ordered the medication for me, and I took it to my doctor, and she gave me the shots. I just had to pay for the office visit. So that's Did not Cheryl true. put down what the cost was? Uh, 
she said it was just about paying for the office, office visit, which is probably usually about thirty five bucks for a copay. Wow, that Cheryl, if, if and Cheryl's another one who uh, um, is going to be taking her. I don't know if she's already taken it, but she will be taking her test. And Cheryl's in a great area uh, between the coast and Waycross where we don't have anybody. Um, there used to be somebody in that area, and there's not anymore. She says she's taking her test in the morning too. Oh, okay. Well, now we're all going to call you and ask. So now the pressure's on. Good luck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. I'm, I'm picking on Cheryl, but um, I'm glad she's there. I'm glad that she's going to be filling in, especially in the area where with RVS species. But see, there's going to be a, a delay time, I think. Two years. Yeah. Before she'll be able to rehab animals, but but unless that's changed, it's two years, right? It's two years after you get first get your license and you have to wait two years, take another test to be able to work right. with the rabies vectors. So, I mean, it's great that Cheryl's taking that step, and I assume you're going to take it at some point. But now there's at least a two-year gap there. But, you know, at least we have a relay point there, um, and Cheryl can help out with that. So, And the other thing is rehabbers are really good about working with each other and sharing information and um, trying to coordinate transfers if, if needed. I, I'm trying to help uh, John and Luann Brooker, who exclusively rehab deer sometimes they'll do squirrels um but they're trying to get some raccoons transferred right now so if you're watching this and you're anywhere near washington county and uh sandersville is where they're located we've got some baby raccoons that we've got to get to either macon like i said that's the closest place or uh lorraine if macon is full so um, I've, I've got to work on that as soon as we finish this course tonight. But um, if anybody wants to take that next step, um, especially if you're in areas where we don't have rehabbers, we'll, we'll really help you out if we can. And we want to, something I touched on earlier, and I, I kind of got off the, my train of thought, was that on the shots, if you're in an area where we're really overworked or we need more help with rabies vectored species and you're willing to to do that kind of work well, we hope to be able to help you with that expense at, at some point um we're, we're working on some fundraising projects um right now to, to help with that kind of a thing well anything as far as advice as far as far as studying or um like i said that's i, I wanted libby here because she's the first one to to take that step so and i know everybody's not going to do that but but while she's here um any advice just work with your local rehabbers yeah um, Lorraine and i don't, I don't think a, we, she's a wealth of information yeah if you can get her to slow down if you can get and her to slow down right now is not the time to go ask lorraine questions um uh, she's she's overworked and everything so um so you work with roxanne davis and janice and Janice Spiller and Valdosta. Janice does only squirrels. And you've got rehabbers, some rehabbers who do small mammals, non rabies species like rabbits, squirrels, chipmunks. Uh, people forget we've got groundhogs in North Georgia, you know, and, and um, so, and then you've got rabies vector species, which are the skunks, foxes, and, and raccoons. And then you've got bird groups. We've got raptors which are all owls eagles hawks um osprey things like that and uh, the closest in south georgia is dr jay weitzel um kind of middle georgia between dublin uh between macon and savannah you got uh, vonda morton in dublin and uh chattahoochee nature center on the north side of atlanta so you've got some raptor centers uh montine mccord is up there too and so you've got Raptor people spread around. Most of our raptors, we're lucky uh, in the South, we have a regular courier that goes every single Friday um, from Valdosta to Auburn University and makes a transfer for us uh, to the Southeastern Raptor Center. And so we catch up almost anything between Valdosta and uh, Auburn going that way. Going back to the shots, we got somebody saying that she cannot take the shots due to health concerns. Does this mean that she should not transport RBS? Yes, okay. absolutely, yeah. 
Uh, and that's not a big deal. You're going to get tons of other animals. There's baby season for deer. Yeah, we don't want you to be. Let's back up. And the the main thing, you know, we're, we want to stress is we do want to rescue animals, but we're going to be legal and we're going to be safe. So um, I, there's a link on the page with a, a lot of the laws, and we were going to uh, read those, but we're not going to bore you with that stuff. You, you need to read it. And most of it is common sense stuff. By taking this volunteer course, you are not a rehabber. Um, you're needed and necessary and appreciated, but your job is to pick up an animal uh, and get it to the rehabber as soon as possible and as safely as possible. And another thing that we are concerned about, we, we're getting tons of calls around Metro Atlanta and Macon, um, and even Columbus, bypass around Columbus, it gets pretty hectic and dangerous. And um, it's baby deer, it's baby deer season, and and I'm getting calls at least two or three a day from the 285 perimeter, for instance. And people freak out; and they want to save that baby deer, but you can't slam on if you're in a vehicle. You can't slam on brakes in traffic when you see a baby deer or a turtle. Um, if you know if somebody's coming behind you, you'll end up creating an accident. You can't run out into traffic to save an animal. You, you've got to uh, think of yourself, think of other people. And um, taking this course, you know, we're, we're trying to give you information as, as this thing progresses and we start really getting into the animal species that you're gonna be working with. You're gonna see some video uh, and you're gonna learn a lot, especially from rehabbers. I, I was a little reluctant about doing this online thing because up until this year, we've done traditional classroom settings where we brought the instructors to one location. We tried to have it at different parts of Georgia so pe more people could come. The problem is it is very difficult to get the best of the best uh, rehabbers to come to one location because they're, they're all busy taking care of animals. Even during the off season, they're getting calls. Um, we were really fortunate. The best one I think we've had was 2014 when you went through. It was in Thomasville. And so we had people came all the way from the Tennessee line down to Thomasville for that course. And the room was packed, 200 or 300 people. And But the instructors, we had uh, Dr. Terry Norton from the Georgia Sea Turtle Center there to talk about turtles and snakes and reptiles. And we had uh, Dr. White, so we covered every major animal group. Um, I was really proud to get uh, Amanda Margraves. And Amanda was, is, okay, I don't know what that was. Amanda was one of the founding uh, five people, including myself, who helped found this organization. And she's since moved to uh, the Florida Keys. She's got a tough life. and. <laughs> She's uh, helped running the, the Florida Keys Wild Bird Center and rescues uh, mostly, obviously, seabirds, pelicans, and gulls and terns and things like that. But they also get a few other animals in there. But um, Amanda came up for that 2014 course. And I had uh, Jennifer Gordon came from Carolina Wildlife Rescue. So the, the, the good part about this is now the online class is I can still get these great instructors and not only will they be able to um, talk to you in the classroom setting that, that uh, Libby went to, we didn't have any live animals. Obviously you can't, we're not going to use live animals for demonstration purposes uh, because we don't want to stress them. But the good part about this online course is Dale and I have been traveling around going to rehabbers and we stand back and videotape them doing their thing. We've been to the Georgia Sea Turtle Center. Um, we videotaped some surgery um, so to show you what happens after uh, when an animal gets there. You know, most of the time you're not going to see this stuff. So um, it's going to be really beneficial. So in fact, why don't we uh, show uh, uh, you got a snippet of that sea turtle center visit? Let's look at that. Looking for it. Okay, we're looking for it. We're going to show you just a, a few sec, a few, few minutes. I don't have that up right now. Oh, you don't? Uh, okay. 
Okay, can you get it in or not? I can. Go ahead and talk and I'll get it for you. Okay, well, wait a minute. What have you got that we could show? What about... Uh, I, can, I can show you the surgery on the one. Okay, I'll, I'll warn you. <laughs> this surgery is... Uh, was it a fracture of an adir's leg, right? Both legs, both rear legs. A fawn too, right? Mm -hmm. This is a tiny little fawn that had two broken legs. And... Um, Believe it or not, this was last summer, and believe it or not, this fawn is now free and... It's amazing, too. Uh, it, it's pretty graphic, uh, but it's, it just shows you what, what happens, and um, why don't you go ahead and show that, Dan. How long is this video doing? It's, I think it's about 10 or 12 minutes at least. Okay, what we're showing you is, is the complete process edited down, obviously. Um, the sedating it and then preparing the area for surgery. It's very obvious where the fracture was, yeah. where the bulge was. I need to say uh, this is at Clanton Malthus and Hodges Veterinary Clinic in Thomasville. And the amount of wildlife that comes through there is probably greater than anything else that any other vet see in Georgia. Um, I'm sure Ray is probably uh, going to quite a few through. Remember the fox we have a little bit worse than this one, yeah. and it's still alive today. Yeah, well, I'll put some photos on uh, on our uh, Facebook site. I'll repost photos of a fox that was hit in Tiff County that was just, I was really amazed that they were, it was a Humpty Dumpty deal. They, they really were. And I've got pictures before and then after it was released, and it actually has been completely released. Here's the screenish part. I had to sit there for him. Probably a bottle of it. Completely broken into it. And you'll see how you can clean your back and get in and take your eyes.
what people are having second thoughts right about now. See how the bones look. Saving that marrow to pass around that way. I don't know if you can hear Dale there, but the doctor's saving the marrow to, to put her back around uh, to use it after before they seal it up. Right. Yeah, he, he, he's going to do that in the smell, but. Then cutting along the bones with wire to keep the wire. I don't remember what the total time on this was, do you? I don't know if that way than on the thing over there. On the toe oh, for surgery? No, it was a lot longer than the yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. This few minutes is, that we filmed it. Yeah, what you're seeing is very... A bridge burst. Yeah, edited uh, snippets of, of the whole procedure. This thing went on for an hour, two, or three. And it, it's amazing the, the team and the care that, that, you know, one little tiny deer got that... Uh, well, this in most cases, and a lot of rehabbers does, don't, do not have the resources. And that's right. another unfortunate situation that uh, um, some rehabbers don't get the cooperation from vets that they should. And sometimes that's because the vets don't realize they can help. A lot, of, a lot of them are under the assumption they can't treat wild animals. That's not true. They can. Uh, they just can't rehab them long term. But they can treat the animal, uh, especially triage treatment. And uh, especially for a rehab, but um, I think some vets don't know that, and unfortunately, I'm a friend. Hi, this mess up our gray and white cat named Tatina. Uh, that's, that's on the video. I did a lot of <laughs> and unfortunately, I'm afraid some vets just don't want the hassle, and so they just say they can't do it as an excuse. Um, we're lucky usually if we have a vet um, near a rehabber. Uh, if, if they're not cooperating, sometimes I can go talk to them or the rehabber can. Or, um, if we explain it, a lot of times they'll, they'll uh, change their course of action. You know, We're really lucky. Uh, or Lorraine's lucky in Thomasville. She's got uh, her regular vet there. And then Thomasville Veterinary Hospital is a few blocks away. And uh, they, t they do a lot of intakes for us also. Then in Tiff County, we've got uh, Quailwood Animal Hospital, and I just can't even say enough about Dr. Branch and his crew there. Um, uh, they take in everything for us, and Dr. Branch has never charged us one single penny for anything that he's done, and he just says that's his way of giving back. Hmm? Yeah, and then in Valdosta, we've got uh, Dr. Pat Mosley. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna start leaving vets out in city, other cities, but uh, uh, he's uh, on Venus Road there, and he does a lot of intakes for us too. 
but I, I don't think anybody does the kind of surgery that they do at Clanton, Hodges, and Malthus. And I may have said that out of order. I don't know if, they, if they're on a pay scale there anymore. They've been to Tallahassee too. Yeah, and then uh, there's a, an eye specialist uh, for animals that comes to Tallahassee, and we've had to get all kinds of special permits uh, to take deer. Uh, I'll post a, a photo of that too. That's an interesting photo of, um, of a farm getting an eye exam. Just out. How much time we got left there now? Uh, doesn't indicate that there's several more minutes still. You, you haven't seen him screwing the. Okay, yeah, well, I was going to cut it short, but we'll wait one more minute or two because you need to see this next part of the procedure. Yeah, he, he's starting to do it now. And this is very. Yeah. 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 Very delicate work. I mean, The dog screaming in the background add to the effect. <laughs> 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 you want to cut this short now and go to something Did else? It show the, yeah, it's showing Yeah, it's showing it now. Yeah, we can, uh, we can cut that short. Okay, uh, I was looking at some of these questions here, and um, Taylor Thornton uh, asked about uh, she wants to get experience working uh, with a vet or an animal hospital that primarily does wildlife, um, and that's probably going to be a little difficult depending on where you are, Taylor. Can you type in what city? Um, like I said, I, I think the the best would be Thomasville. I don't know if that's doable for you, but uh, um, I know they they really work well with us, and I'm sure they would allow that. And you could uh, get experience from not only uh, the animal hospital there, but from Lorraine Conklin, and especially if that's something you're you're looking to go into as a career, which uh, apparently uh, that unless you're just looking at their whole rehab or thing. Um, let me go over a couple of things. Uh, I, I just, again, I can't stress enough that um, the, the rules and the laws are going to be up there. You can't, uh, your job is to get an animal from here to there as soon and safely as possible with minimal contact. Um, most everybody has been doing that really well. Every once in a while, we find out that somebody's trying to keep something. And uh, if you if you're here thinking that you're going to be in a Disney movie and the the birds are going to hang your clothes on the clothesline, um, if you still use a clothesline, and you know the rabbits are going to frolic around um, and dance, that you're you're in the wrong place because um, that's not what rehabbing is about. You do get to see some really cute fluffy animals and then some ugly possums or vultures or whatever. <laughs> but I'm, I'm sorry, I'm being prejudiced. But, but um, the thing about it is, if you're doing it the right way, 
and uh, you, for the right reasons, you're going to see more animals. You know, if you're trying to keep something illegally, first of all, we're going to boot you out, and you're probably going to get charged um, because we always find out about it somehow. Um, and again, we're you know we're going to be legal, and we're going to to do the right thing for the animals. And and then the other thing is, if you're doing it for the right reasons, um, the way this works is when we get an animal call in your area, in your county, we'll contact you and, and say, hey, Taylor or whoever, uh, we've got a, 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 an, a transport, can you handle it? Um, you either need to say, yes, I can get it, or no, I'm sorry, I've got work, or I don't feel good. That, what, what, you know, if you can't do it, you can't do it. But if the question is, what kind of an animal is it? Um, we don't like that question because if you're choosing your transports based on whether you think it's, oh, it's will be a cute animal. Yeah, I'll do it. Or um, that's not fair to everybody else. You take them as they come. And, you know, if you can't for legitimate reason, we don't worry about the reason. If you can't, you just say, no, I'm sorry, I can't. And that's why we hope that we're going to have uh, uh, multiple volunteers. We love to have teams. And we like to have alternates in areas. So um, we want to be able to say that's fine and then call the next people on the list. So if you know other people who want to be volunteers, then please encourage them to, to sign up because we can never have too many. Um, we've got some counties where we've got two dozen. And sometimes for one reason or another, I'll run the whole list and people are in school or on vacation or sick or whatever, and I'll end up, you know, still not finding a volunteer. And then there's some counties where we do not have anybody for two or three counties and people drive. I've, some of our volunteers, Libby's made some huge long trips, um, one, like she mentioned in her video for the snake eggs. Uh, do you have that other video up Sea Turtle Center yet? No, I, I won't be able to do it this class. Oh, you won't be able to do it this class. Okay. All right, we'll skip that. But um, we're, and let, I guess I need to explain the way this is going to work is you, you can take any of the courses that you, the sessions after this that you want to. This first one uh, to go over the rules and what, you know, what's required um, is, is important. But subsequent sessions will, will mean basically you, you get to transport what you train in. So uh, the more animal session, the more sessions you take, the more transport you're going to get to do because we're going in these subsequent sessions, they're going to be more enjoyable for you because you're going to see a lot more animals. Um, we're going to be in the field a lot doing video and um, we'll be working with animals. So you'll know you're basically you're there uh, by video. Do you want to take them on a typical uh, uh, call? Uh, with yeah, you've got, out? you've got a, uh, uh, Jan, let me tell them a little uh, about Jan first while you get that ready. Uh, um, Jan and Jill are sisters, and they went through the 2012 course, I think. And they got out of the 2000. Amy, did you go through that course too? That was your first one, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and Tiff's in here. Yeah. Um, I was asking Amy Hyde um, over there. Um, but. Uh, that was the 2012 course. That was the very first year we had it. Jan and Jill got out of the class and in less than an hour, it just worked out that way. Uh, Jan's favorite thing are raptors, especially owls, but she likes hawks and owls and eagles and things like that. And within an hour of getting out of the class, we got a call about uh, an injured hawk and they had to go actually capture it box it and we'll we'll get into that too we use boxes for raptors and almost all birds not not cages or care, kennel carriers and so i mean she she's from her first day she started and she's been wide open ever since and i think jan is going to be taking her test pretty soon i hope um i'm trying to encourage her but uh why don't we look at that and with jan uh the bird was unfortunate here uh, i had some bad luck because it got injured but I'm a Georgia Wildlife Rescue volunteer, and I just got a call about a screech owl. We think it's a screech owl, and we're going to pick it up up in the Ashley. I got involved, and, and um, 
Georgia Wildlife Rescue because I love animals anyway. And um, and it just gives you such a good feeling to, to be able to help an animal, to be able to go out and, you know, rescue a hawk or an eagle and just to, just to know that you're the one that saved. You know, one person can make a difference. That's why it's so important we get more volunteers because the more people we have in the area, the more help we can. My sister and I took the first class in, I think it was May of 2012. And about after we took the class, about two hours later, we got our first wildlife call. And it was a red hawk. We had to go out and uh, catch the hawk, and he was in a tree, way up in a tree. So one of us uh, got a towel and held, and uh, the other one went around in front of him and scared him. So we were able to, you know, distract him. So we were able to catch him in a towel. And uh, that was a good I have a neighbor who lives down the road, and she's 15, and she's going to be taking the class Thursday night. And uh, you can be 15 or you can be 68. It doesn't matter how old you are. As long as you can still get out and help animals, there's no age limit. You know, we like to get the younger children because we want to get the younger generation involved. But we still want the older people because that, that's what keeps some people going is helping, helping other things, helping out the second life you have now. I taught school all my all for 30 years, and now I can get out and help Adam side now to uh, pick up the, the owl. And we have to fill out an, an intake form before we pick him up. So we're going to uh, we went to leave for work this morning, and there was an owl just in our front yard. So my wife, I guess, called you guys. Yeah. And then here you are. Yeah. And he seems to be doing better. I, we moved, yes. I moved him this morning to get him out of the, where our driveway is. Yes. And he didn't put up much fight. But when I went to box him up, he was a little feisty. He wanted yeah. to peck and claw. So I it assume looks, that's probably a good thing. It looks like a screech owl. Maybe, maybe he is. So tiny. Just Going to my front door this morning, uh, got outside next to the somewhat close to the back of my truck. And almost, I wasn't sure what it was. You know, you cut your grass and almost looked from 20 feet away, you know, like it could have been a ball of uh, dead grass or something. Yes, yeah. And uh, so, but I walked back there and, you know, kind of looked down and it was moving its head around a little bit. <laughs> so we just called, I think we called the DNR for, we called a vet, we know first, he told us to call the DNR called the DNR and they suggest that they told us to call, call the DNR at all. And they said to call you guys over in Tipton. Yeah. And so once we got in touch with, I guess, the guy that works there at the office, he said to box it up and that he would send somebody out there. Now, so just tell me right quick what was what, what 
you know about it. Okay, the, the man found him in his yard this morning, and uh, he was just sitting there. So, you know, that's he said he left him only this morning. Yes, sir.
that. That was it, Chip. You're back. Okay. Um, they touched on a couple of things in that video that, that we do need to cover. Um, in your documents, if you go to the files there and somewhere down there on the page, and some of you already have the form, I can email it to you. The wildlife intake form is the one of the most important things. Let me pull mine up so I can talk about it while we do it. Um, that you'll do every time you pick up an injured or orphaned animal, every time you transport an animal, period, you need to fill out this form. It's super simple, but it's super important. Um, the, the little box in the top right hand corner, uh, and if you can't pull it up right now, that's fine, but you'll, it's, you'll remember this, it's real easy. The, top, the box in the top right corner is where you fill in the date and the time in your name. That's the only place you'll put your name. It's assigned to you. Um, and uh, as you transfer it, if a lot of times you're going to be meeting another person uh, somewhere to, you know, to do a relay. Um, and we, we like to do animals in one transport without a relay if possible. It's less stressful on the animal, but sometimes that's not possible. So, um, oh, I thought you had a question, <laughs> but um, the fill out the top part and there's a case number and we'll assign you the case number. And that form, uh, one form stays with the animal. So when you hand it to the next person or if you're transporting it to the vet or the rehabber, that form stays with the animal. You need to do a second one to mail in to us. Uh, at, at our P.O. box, and I suggest you don't have to, but I suggest you do one for yourself. I don't, you'll see they're very short, so you could hand fill it out easy. I, I suggest you keep one for your own records, just for, if nothing else, just to keep up with how many animals you, you'll be surprised uh, if you do this a long time, what you've transported and you've got a record of it. And also if there's ever a question, something pops up, uh, but uh, looking on the form, the first section after the little box is who found it. Um, and that needs to be filled out as much as possible. Always get a phone number or two. We prefer two if you can get them. Um, nowadays, people are cutting off their home phones. They, so they may only have a cell phone. The name and address of the, where the person lives and email. Um, and then the information about the animal itself if you know the species great if you don't just you know it's a squirrel if you don't know the difference between a, a fox squirrel and, and that's not criticizing because you know or owls can be confusing sometimes for some people you know it's an owl so don't worry about whether it's a, a barred owl b-a-r-r-e-d or a barn owl by the way barred owls are the owls that we get statewide in Georgia more than any other, but because of two reasons, they're, they're quite numerous. And then the way they hunt um, is different. When we get into raptors, we're going to have a section just on raptors that you're going to be really amazed at some of the information that comes out and all of these sessions about animals, but the owls are, are part of my favorite. So you want to do the species. Um, the reason obviously it's injured it's got a broke leg a broke wing or you know it's an orphan again we like to verify that it's an orphan if possible um or you know if you don't find if you find a fawn and you don't find a dead doe but there's something wrong with the the baby deer a lot of times they'll have flies on it or maggots you know that's that can't stay in the woods obviously um so you, you fill out that information there's another question, what action did you take? That, you need to be working with a vet or a rehabber before you take any action. The only thing you might do occasionally is hydrate an animal um, in an emergency. Hydration is one of the most important things you can do um, to save an animal's life. The little screech owl you just saw in that video survived and was later released, which um, if you saw it at the first of the video, it was pretty lethargic. I think they gave him lactated ringers probably. Um, and Dr. Weitzel, uh, one of our rehabbers in the southern part of the state, um, a lot of people are surprised he'll, you know, meet a courier on the side of the road and the first thing they'll do is find a quiet place and he'll hydrate it right there. Sometimes 
uh, intravenously, sometimes orally, whatever. But uh, and you can see the change almost immediately when it's hydrated. Um, and then fill out all these little little questions. You know, how long have they had it? Um, if they fed it, we hope they haven't had it and fed it very long because a lot of times they feed it the wrong thing. You know, they're they're uh, feeding it something that it shouldn't need naturally. Um, and people mean well, but but you know it doesn't always work out well. Um, another question that's super important with RBS, rabies vector species, did it bite or scratch anyone? Um, one of the, the problems that we have, baby raccoons are some of the cutest things you'll ever see, but they can potentially carry rabies and you would never look at them and know it or suspect it. Um, never handle them without your gloves. You should hopefully have your vaccinations and, um, uh, no cutesy pictures holding them up to your face and <clears throat> that kind of thing. Um, you know, don't, don't take a chance with any, first of all, our job is to save the animals. And if somebody gets a photo, we, we like to post photos, educational photos, um, you know, we're working with animals, but if there's an opportunity for somebody to take it without putting more stress on the animal by posing the animal we, we don't like to do that so the most important thing uh for some besides the medical information but for some especially federally protected species is the location where it was found um this is really important with uh raptors owls eagles and hawks it's really really important with gopher tortoises because gopher tortoises um can be struck by a vehicle and we can rehab them and repair their shell. Almost all of the severely injured turtles and tortoises in Georgia go to the Georgia Sea Turtle Center. And people think they only deal with sea turtles. That's not true at all. They deal with the tiniest little, uh, the smallest turtle in Georgia is called a bog turtle. It's one of the rarest too. And then they also deal with box turtles and regular yellow bellied sliders, but gopher tortoises. It's the only tortoise in Georgia. We're going to have a whole session just on turtles and tortoises. Um, you, you, you got it? Okay, how are we doing on time? We've got time. Why don't, well, let me, let me finish this form. I think uh, the location, finishing the location, uh, and, and let me finish up on the gopher tortoise thing. The reason it's important with gopher tortoises are because there is a disease that that species of tortoise can get it's called upper respiratory tract disease and it is highly contagious to other gopher tortoises it won't hurt humans at all and in fact it won't hurt other animals usually but uh gopher tortoises live in colonies and um the colonies have usually build up an immunity to it hopefully and uh there's genetics involved with all, obviously when you relocate a tortoise, if you pick up a tortoise on the side of the road and carry it two or three miles away and put it with another colony, you might mean well, but you could be wiping out an entire colony um, by letting them get diseased and they will die quicker than than, than you could imagine. It, and it's very sad to see. It's uh, upper respiratory failure. It's a lot of congestion and um, problems like that. So um, we like to, to treat them when they're treated at the Georgia Sea Turtle Center, they're kept in an isolated area. They know what they're doing. They treat them, they bring them back and we release them back with their colony. So that's why that's super important. Um, another thing is why we mentioned turtles and we'll get into more turtle stuff in that particular session. But if you see a turtle crossing the road, most of you probably know this, you move it in the direction it was going further across the road. You don't take it this way because you think it's safer. It's just going to try and recross. Um, and if there's some reason that that doesn't look safe, then pick up the phone. If you're a volunteer, then you, you're going to have our information to call us and we'll we'll decide make a decision. But in most cases, it needs to be let let go where it's going. Uh, do you think you can pull that up? I was going to try and show you a snippet of the Georgia Sea Turtle Center. What was this? Do you remember what we took? 
I get them mixed up. It may have been. We, a went, we took two and picked up two, I believe. A gopher, we took a gopher tortoise, didn't we? I think. I've taken, taken lots of turtles and tortoises to the sea turtle center. The one the trip that Dale went with me on, I can't remember what it was. So I should tap dance, is what you're yeah, saying. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm tap dancing sitting down. I still think this is better than the, uh, and we're going to keep improving these classes. We thought about some things tonight uh, while we were preparing that are going to make the next sessions better. We're going. I'm on the other side of this, but it sounds like Rachel. Um, I think that's Rachel. I can't tell. Um, 
And even though it's discolored, eventually the pigment will fill back in and then it'll look pretty normal. It might look a little weird for a little while. Um, we've got a lot of therapists over here. Therapists are a big species that we see um, in the spring and summer. They're coming up onto our causeway to nest. Um, and so they're getting hit by cars. Um, we also get terrapins from the St. Simons Island Causeway and from the Tybee Island Causeway. Um, and they're also treated with that bone cement product. We also use screws and wire to help stabilize fractures. Um, they're a, a pretty and unique species that we have. Um, transport um, the more you're gonna really just get the fever to do this and especially um, Jacob Walsh just made I think our most recent trip that was his very first transport I think uh, he took a injured turtle on World Turtle Day to the Georgia Sea Turtle Center so, and Jacob loves reptiles so um, I think Jacob's with us tonight um, Jake sorry um, but uh, the, Taking an animal over there, uh, first of all, when you do take an animal to any of these re to any of our rehabbers, um, you know you don't want to get in the way. And uh, when you go to a place like the Georgia Sea Turtle Center, they're all about caring for, you know, some of the most protected animals in the world. They do have a visitation area; the public's always watching, so um, you know they're they've got to be aware of that. And um, when you go, you're usually going in an area where the public does not have access. And so you don't want to uh, um, overstep and, and get in the way. You want to kind of step back. And if they ask you if you want to look in here or something, that's fine. Um, don't go up and try and hug a sea turtle. That's not cool. And somebody may have done that one time. Um, yeah, you don't you don't reach over and touch touch animals, whether no matter where it is or what it is. Um, Look at a couple of, I kind of got tickled a while ago. I guess uh, Julie and Gail, Gail took up for the vultures, Gail Westcott and Julie took up for possums when I was criticizing, um, not criticizing, but anyway. And uh, I appreciate Sharon was answering uh, Taylor's question about uh, 
where to get some experience working with vets. And Sharon has some good suggestions around the Atlanta area um, for working, get, getting some experience. And I'm looking at a couple of other questions. One that actually is uh, pretty common, and Karina asked this one, is every, most people have heard that armadillos can carry leprosy, and it is a form of leprosy, but I'm told, and from what I understand, um, that it doesn't affect humans. But And now we're getting into a gray area because the mission of the Georgia Wildlife Rescue Association, when we formed it, was to, it's a very simple short sentence. Our mission is to save and protect Georgia's native wildlife. So the word native there, um, we put that there on purpose because we don't tend, we, you know, we don't want to get called out to do other things that are not in our mission statement. And armadillos, I guess you might say they're native now because they're sure here, but uh, um, I remember when they first started showing up when I was a kid, it was like aliens, you know, and uh, coyotes the same way. So some rehabbers will not treat them, and that's up to the rehabber. If you're in an area where you've got an armadillo or a coyote or a non-native animal and uh, the rehabber will, will treat it and you want to transport it and you can do so safely, that's fine. But you need to make sure, you know, if it's our mission statement says Georgia's native wildlife. So. Um, we don't get too hung up on that as long as the rehabber is willing to accept it and the other person is willing to, to transport it. And uh, trying to see if there's anything else there. Um, while we were, while I was watching the video of uh, Jan earlier, um, there were a couple of things. She talked about catching the raptor and uh, then you saw Dr. Branch obviously put on his gloves. Um, we worked out a deal with uh, this company and you've got the form, I think it may have changed slightly. It's called a wildlife startup kit. You can put something together yourself. Um, one of the things that I, I've recommended until you get some long, I recommend getting these longer gloves with the special padding, but you can go to Walmart and I'm not a big fan of Walmart, but I know right where you can go in Walmart. You can go to the sports section where they have camping gear in Walmart, and they're uh, trying to think of the name brand. You know what that name brand was? Lodge, I think, something like that. Anyway, it's in. It's usually on the top shelf where they have the camping gear. There is a really thick red glove that's a heavy duty almost like a welding glove but they're flexible and they work really well and they're very inexpensive so you can get those temporarily i recommend if you're going to do this and be serious and you need to protect yourself get that wildlife startup kit because the most important thing that comes with it are these gloves and i have worn out three sets of these and i really need to get a new set right now because my hand showed through the bottom of that but uh, they have this protective flap here, and I've had some really rough animals. Uh, you know, if an animal's injured and, and you're trying to get it, it's just afraid, it's hurting, and, you know, it's, it's freaking out, and so it's going to bite. It's got these flaps here to protect your hands, and um, they're, they're actually a lot more flexible than they appear. But, uh, um, and then even then, I still like to use a towel and something to you know first of all if you if they can't see you is can that made out of kevlar i i don't know if it's true kevlar um i think it i think it was advertised that way it, it is kevlar yeah it 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 it's, it must be a very lightweight form because it doesn't feel like the vest we used to wear Dale and i both are former popos poly but the other things that come in the kit are these uh these are not snake tongs. If you look at the ends of them, um, they're shaped to to get uh, mammals, small mammals. And um, first of all, 
if you're going to be dealing with with rabies vector species again you need to be wearing gloves you need to have your shots um, you need to be working with a rehabber who knows what they're doing um, and still i prefer not to touch them if possible you catch these behind the shoulder. this is not for the neck as much as like behind this on the shoulders and hold it down until you can secure it get it in a carrier quickly um and secure it have a place for it to hide in there some towels and whatever um i think this still comes with the kit i i've never used this i there are probably situations where, where yeah, i have used i used it uh i caught help dnr uh, we moved an alligator but uh um the only way i would use a noose is one like this you can't tell it on here it's got a protective plastic coating over the cable and um it's a real thick plastic and so it's there's not no metal strands are going to stick into the animal the other thing i like about it is uh when you draw it up i don't know how much of this is showing up um but but when you pull it up first of all don't we try not to do it around the neck the animal's going to go nuts usually um you we try and do it kind of catch them at an angle um i don't know how to, we'll, we'll do that in a different video but it's got a quick release um if the animal's having difficulty um breathing or or you're having a hard time you just pull that out and it's got a spring release that uh, works very quickly and um like i said i don't really like that i've never used that except in that one situation um most of the animals that you're going to deal with are going to be injured in orphan babies and most of this stuff will never come into play uh, for those of you who are really brave and um remove a snake um these tongs can come with uh with the uh kit or you can substitute something else for it i think but um Obviously, you're going to need to, if you're dealing with that, you need to know venomous from non-venomous, and we're going to get into, we're going to have a session on just that kind of stuff, too. What are we doing on time? We'll probably need to wrap it up pretty soon. Yeah, we're about nine minutes over. Now. Nine over? Okay. Let me look at my list here. Um, let me go over over this. I, I, we approved a, quite a few people right at the last minute because we didn't have time to verify, and uh, to be honest, I want as many volunteers as we can get so we didn't turn down i don't think we turned down anybody we just approved everybody at the last minute if you have not joined if your membership is not up to date please do that because 30 bucks a year is not anything and we can take all, all of it adds up and um then the 20 dollars for a class um we, we had to buy some equipment to do this and dell and i travel around a lot um to rehabbers and um believe believe me we're not this is not a money making venture <laughs> um we're covering expenses if that so um we're in and, and what our ultimate goal is to have a fun we've got a fundraiser coming up we want to be able to help these rehabbers most of georgia's rehabbers with the exception of about four or five probably most of georgia's rehabbers are people who do this in their own homes with their own money out of their pocket and they're very limited funds and i you know we want to be able to help those people if somebody calls and says in a recent case my air conditioner went out and you know it's baby season we they've got a room for a, a storage it's not a storage building but that nice little building full of animals and they need help we want to be able to to help them and the other thing I guess in, on that form that, that I didn't cover um, is always, if you're doing a transfer, always ask the person if they can say, if you, if, or if you're able to explain the rehabber situation that rehabbers do this with their own money and ask the person if, are you, will, can you give any kind of a small contribution to, to help take care of this animal you're giving us? And if they say, no, I'm sorry, then we're going to still try and care for the animal and you need to explain that. But if they can't, you'll be surprised. Somebody might fork out, you know, a $10 bill and somebody might fork out a hundred dollar bill. So that money needs to go with the animal to the rehab. So, um, if somebody's willing to give you a contribution for that animal and, um, they're care enough to, to do that, then 
send it with the animal to the destination that it's going to, whether it's, uh, you know, Lorraine Conklin in Thomasville or, you know, a rehabber, no matter where it is, um, where is in Atlanta. Um, some of these fun, some of these uh, rehabbers are nonprofits and uh, they do have fundraisers and we'd like to encourage when, when they're having a fundraiser, try and get people to, to support them because we end up sending them animals too. So uh, we like to support the other organizations that are 501c3 nonprofits, but unfortunately, the vast majority of the rehabbers in Georgia are not are not 501c3s. They're just people trying to do the best they can with what they got, and we like to be able to help them. So we have some plans to do that, and I hope it works out. One of the things we did last year was the Buy Low Food Corporation bought out Harvey supermarkets. And the first year I mentioned to you when we first started that Harvey's uh, helped us do a massive uh, support drive for the Georgia, for the uh, Deepwater Horizon rescue. And every year since Harvey supermarkets has supported our wildlife rescue efforts. Every summer we run out of, you know, uh, goat milk for the baby deer and whatever food. And Harvey's has always tried to help us uh, with that. And last year, uh, the Bilo Food Corporation bought out Harvey's and I was kind of panicking because they're a big company. And I said, well, there goes our local support, but they really stepped in and they gave us, I think it was uh, gift cards in the amount of 200 or $250. And I was able to give those out to rehabbers all over the place. And this year, we're trying to work with them to split those cards up because the Harvey supermarkets are in the southern part of the state. And I think the Bilo's are in the northern part of the state. It's all the same company. So we're asking for these uh, gift cards um, to be regionally distributed so they can go to rehabbers that do have that particular grocery store close by and, and they can use those. Um, and let's see what else to get some more questions and comments in there too. Okay. Can you catch me up? I'm... All right. Uh, this one lady wants to know, are there going to be classes on what to study for the test? Or yeah. what study material do you recommend? Yeah, we're actually going to um now and that's jumping way ahead because most again, most people are going to be content to be volunteers when they can. But who asked that? That's great. Cheryl? Uh, Sharadi Gamble. Okay. Um, uh, the, the good part is that if you're willing to, I'm trying to, I can't remember where she's at, but if, if you're in an area, especially when we need rehabbers, we're going to do everything we can to, to help you take that test and take that, that, that's a huge, great big step. And Libby's going to be working with some people on that. And, we're going to try and put it together something to really help you. The best thing you can do is do like Libby did. She worked with at least four rehabbers, maybe five. Um, the more experience you can get, because all rehabbers have their own techniques and they specialize in different animals. And the more you can work with these people, um, the more knowledge you're going to pick up and you're going to have your own aptitude and, and you're going to pick up on some things that you're interested in. So um, I think that uh, we're probably going to have a session just for people who want to take, but it's going to be at the end, it's, uh, after we do all the others, just for the, we'll call it something like uh, wildlife, the wildlife rehab course or something. But it's going to be um, for that step to go from volunteer to a wildlife rehabber. And again, you need to make sure you know what you're getting into. Um, it's really, really tough. Uh, vacations are a thing of the past if you like the summertime and the beach. Sleep's gone. Yep, sleep's gone. Libby's back there uh, um, reminded me that, uh, you know, baby season for animals starts, you know, earlier in the spring every year. And I don't, I'm not going to get into the whole uh, global warming thing, but the, the climate and things are changing. It's affecting animals. We see it every year. Uh, animals come in 
earlier. Babies come earlier. They're born longer into the, I think Lorraine got a baby deer right at the beginning of November last year, which was crazy. Um, and then uh, I think we got our first one in February. So, and keeping in mind that May and June are when uh, fawns are born the most. Yeah, well, that's got it says you mentioned earlier that you can transport what you've been trained on. Can we get more info on when the next courses, especially the species specific trainings will be held? Yeah. Posted before we end this evening. Yeah, yeah. We're we're gonna we're gonna try and have the the next we're gonna really try and speed this process up and get these courses out quicker. And in some cases, if it's a simple transport, we'll go ahead and let you do that. If it's especially if it's an emergency, uh, we would rather somebody who's in the process of, of learning this and wanting to do it rather than the general public who, um, you know, uh, somebody was going to transport a baby deer today and um, they had this big plastic kennel carrier. And I can't tell you how many times we've seen baby deer uh, leave where it was found at healthy except we, it was just an orphan, you know, the mom's dead on the highway and the baby's healthy, but when it gets to the destination, it's got a broke leg or two, as in one case, that might be what the Thomasville beer was, I don't remember. But what happens is, just think of the movie Bambi and, you know, a slippery, the bottom of a kennel carrier is nothing but plastic. If you don't put rubber or a carpet down there, it's gonna freak out, it doesn't know where it's at, and the legs go through the door and you, you end up with what was a healthy baby deer with, with a broke leg or two or birds. That's another thing. Um, that's why we don't put um, birds into cages. Birds, uh, especially raptors, but uh, we we put birds in boxes because for two reasons. They, they're in a cage cage. Um, that's even worse because, you know, they're freaking out. They can see everything. If they're in a kennel carrier, um, there are a couple of problems with that. You're going in and out of the front, and getting them in there is a lot easier than getting them out. If you, you can hold their wings, and when you put them in, they go in, and you shut the door, and if you even put a towel over it, they may be calm. But then when you get to your destination, the getting out part is where they end up breaking their wing more or getting hurt because the person's opening the door. And from the raptor's point of view, you see this guy coming at you like this and they freak out. And then you've got to pull them out of there. And unless you have their wings down, they're going to get caught on the door. So um, this is one of the most important things you can keep in your trunk. And this is almost the perfect size. Maybe it could be a bit taller, um, but the square part is perfect um, for a raptor. Almost any bird of prey. Uh, in fact, it's way too big for a screech owl. But, uh, you know, uh, barred owls, great horned owls, barn owls, um, almost all the hawks. Um, you put them in a box first, you poke some holes in it first before you put them in there, throw some newspaper on the bottom or a towel, something to absorb it if they go to the bathroom. Fold the lid, lids down the way you can do with a box. You don't use tape at all. And uh, the other thing is when it gets to the rehabber, first of all, the sides are smooth, um, so it's not going to injure itself. And then when it gets to, and it's dark, so it, it can't see, that calms it down. But when it gets to the rehabber, the other important thing is, obviously you're going in and out of the top. And that's a, a huge difference, getting a bird in and out of the, of the top as opposed to pulling them from the front or the back. We have another comment here. Okay. Victoria Smith Osteen, have you considered doing a GWR shirt for volunteers by themselves? And we could wear actually victoria actually um before i got here i was went up and uh what i've got on is actually I, I i just asked everybody in the room what they thought about this cap because we're looking at shirts caps and and maybe a few other things for our volunteers and by the way uh victoria i better brag on her since we just mentioned her she's only been volunteering a few weeks now and she's already transported no telling what especially from Libby, who's sitting here. Victoria, we lucked out. She lives in Hayhire or in Lowndes County. 
Uh, she lives in Hayar, Hayar, I think. Yep, her husband's a police, so we like that, a deputy. Um, and uh, But uh, Victoria works in Douglas, so she drive, makes that drive on a regular basis every day, every weekday. And uh, um, with Roxanne and Douglas, we've always got birds going to Roxanne or mammals coming this way. So uh, Victoria's going to get a lot of experience real quick, maybe more than she's bargained for. She's suggesting that we can use these as fundraisers. Absolutely. That's it. That's exactly. We're probably going to have a shirt uh, that's exclusively for volunteers for train people um, that says wildlife rescuer or something like that, um, that, you know, kind of identifies our folks more. Um, and I'm going to wrap it up real quick, uh, but I, I want to touch on a couple of things before we do. Um, we do want to do more focus on fundraising, so we're going to have some some shirts, you know, that the general public can buy. Um, the when you can, please encourage people to join the the GWRA, not just to be a volunteer. Everybody can't be a volunteer. We understand that, but. Um, people would join the, the more members we have the more we can do with rehabbers the more we can help them out um, I'd love to, to be able to help some uh, expand and do some things they, they a lot of them have plans and things they want to do and we want to help them do that and uh, and then we, I'd like to be able to help some people get some rabies shots or vaccinations um, if they need them um, so it, you know you can encourage people to join and, and be a member and there's different levels they can do that and and again encourage people to if they want to go if they live in an area where they have a rehabber that lives in their area and works in their area they go support that person directly they don't certainly don't have to go through us but as long as we're all working toward the same thing which is going to help help the rehabbers that's what we want to do and again it's our mission is real simple to, to save and protect georgia's native wildlife one of the ways that we do that is is by besides going out and doing it physically is by the educational uh, things that we're going to be doing and, and we're probably going to apply and get our exhibition permits and start doing school programs i used to do that when i was with the dnr um, and that's something where some of you guys can can help and get more experience and it it's man it's fun going to talk to kids and you know uh, we did festivals um Work with DNR a lot and some other agencies, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Were there other questions? I don't have my glasses. I think that's about it. Um, we're going to be posting some more things on this particular first introduction to wildlife rescue um, forms. If you've got anything that you uh, that we didn't cover, and I'm sure there's something. I was I've been kind of nervous all night after the, those last two classes. I was waiting for something bad to happen. I think we pulled it through. I know we might have had some technical things here, but this was minor compared to. I'm really pleased. Um, it's informal, and that's the way it yeah. needs to be. To get the information exchanged. You're really going to enjoy as we move forward when we really start focusing on animal groups. You're really going to enjoy it. You're going to see things that you couldn't see sitting in a classroom. I do enjoy doing a classroom setting where I get to meet everybody and hopefully I'll get to meet all you guys at some point. Uh, another thing I guess we need to touch on is we will be having, uh, hopefully we're going to start having some kind of an annual conference or something and maybe some updated training at that. But, and, but that is going to be for training and for, for purposes of meeting each other and networking um, as much as anything, because like I said, it's really hard to get the rehabbers there. If we can get rehabbers at these things, we will. But to be honest, the bulk of our training will be done with videos um, and these kinds of sessions and then by you working with your local rehabbers. While you're on that, let's make a suggestion to if people can get someone to go with them and record their calls that they're going on. That yeah, that'd be, be very great. Beneficial to us. Yeah, uh, and they can post them on on, the, on this page. Yeah, that's a really good really point. Nice. Um, take, uh, you know, and when I said earlier, we were talking about photos. Um, you know, use common sense. Don't don't stress the animal out. Don't do things that are abnormal. But uh, you saw how Dale put the video together with Jan getting the screech out. Um, 
that's, you know, that was basically he just videotaped what was happening naturally. There was no posing going on there. Um, and then if, uh, if you can get video, um, hold your camera like this, Dale. Yeah, hold it sideways. Yeah, don't hold it long ways. I learned that. I got criticized by somebody that's in this room. But <laughs> um, hold your camera like this and, um, and try and be steady. <laughs> And uh, and just be aware and 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 any other points. To, if, if you can't video, pictures are good too. Yeah, but uh, it, I think it'd be invaluable in a lot of ways if we could show other people uh, what what is going on, what what people are yeah, accomplishing. Uh, especially, and sometimes it's a great recruiting tool. Yeah, it is a good recruiting tool. But uh, again, I I don't want people to to overdo it with the cute cut don't be posting pictures on your facebook site of you kissing a raccoon in the mouth um you know don't be stupid I, when's, what's the next class and when is it and they won't know if they can get a list of rehabbers and a list of the dwra members yeah the list of rehabbers should be look on look on the links there's a document on this page that says links and let me pull it up and I think it says, yeah. In fact, I'll go down this whole list real, really quick. And the good thing is, if you need to sign off this live session, if you got something to go do, you can go do that um, because this is recorded. You come back and watch this. Okay, now this is not working. Okay, I've got it. All right, the 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 very first thing on the links page should be the DNR wildlife rehabbers list, and if you click on that, um, just remember that it is divided into sections. The first section is birds, and uh, these every section is done the same way. You have first the county, so you find the rehabber for your county, and you're you know, a lot of counties do have them, but you're going to, you're going to be surprised a lot of counties don't. Um, then there's the name of the rehabber and the organization, uh, like if it's a vet or, you know, or Coffee Wildlife Rescue, which is uh, um, Roxanne Davis or AWARE, or, you know. Um, but you got to remember a lot of these that are listed on these, uh, in these groups, like the birds, you got Bells Ferry Veterinary Hospital, a great organization. They they help a lot. That is like emergency care. So you don't just because it says rehabber, they don't do a lot of long term rehabbing. Uh, the same thing with in Clark County, you've got Athens Regional Veterinary Services. Um, you know they do what they can. That's Dr. Vincent Smith. But uh, a lot of these is deceptive to me not on purpose, but, but they, it's, they just don't do long-term rehabbing. Uh, wildlife rehabilitator is like, again, like Roxanne at Coffee Wildlife Rescue or Vonda Morton up at Dublin at Lawrence Wildlife Rescue or AWARE or Chattahoochee Nature Center or somebody doing it in their house like Libby um, or, you know, Jennifer Spiller. Um, so, You've got to look at the list and, and you need to ask them if they're going to be able to take it and give it long-term care to the release. That's our goal is to rehab and release back into the wild. Um, and this, uh, you know, then the, you've got birds, but then you've also got a group just for raptors. So that's completely separate. And again, you've got some people in this group for raptors that can do triage care short-term care, but they will not do long-term rehab care. And that's that's where this list, when you first look at this list, um, it may look impressive because there's a lot on it, but a lot of these people don't do long-term care. So uh, you got deer listed separately, then you've got small mammals, and the small mammals you've got to pay attention because um, there's the, the, com the column on the far left you've got to look for that little check mark to see if they are RBS certified. In other words, if you've got a raccoon, a fox, or a skunk, um, 
you start seeing real quick that a lot of those do not have that little check and they're not RBS. And even the ones that do say they're RBS may be like a veterinary clinic that can treat it short term, but they're not going to be able to nurse it from a little raccoon with the eyes closed to old enough to be released. So uh, that's where, can you show this map, Dale? And turn this where I can see it there. I know this is not showing up very well, and I'm gonna have to tell you where. Um, I've got my finger on Macon, Georgia, right here. So that's Macon, and that's red. Red is rabies vector species. Am I talking in the mic? I don't know if I am. But that's uh, rabies vector species. Um, we're going. I'm going to put something together and send it to you. So you'll have this, not not this map, but actually a, a graphic that we're going to, to provide for you. Um, but if you look from Macon South, there's only one red dot down here, and that is Lorraine Conklin, who does rabies vector species. So you've got this huge gap all the way from the ocean all the way across, and then you've only got a few statewide who do it. And the reason why I, I don't have red for some of the ones on the list is because they don't do it long term. So I, I'm not going to put this is a map for that I keep actually for my own purposes at home. And I can, when I get a call, um, I'm looking at that. Chet, they're asking about a, a, the GWRA members list and also wanting to know if uh, you can make that list more comprehensive, for example, including who is going to keep and who is going to do triage. Basically, yeah, the, the problem with that, can you come back this way for that? The problem with that uh, is this list is maintained and put out by the Georgia Department of Natural Resources. This is not our list. Um, maybe we could work to, to get this more comprehensive for our purposes. Um, maybe I can talk with Sue Eigen about that or something, but this is the list that we have to go by by the Georgia DNR. And to be honest, I've ticked some people off because there are some people who claim that, and, and I think they fully believe they are they're rehabbers and they were licensed, but for one reason or another, if they're not on this list and the Georgia DNR does not list them, we're not gonna send them animals. Um, and, and they need to clear that up with the DNR. And they're they're not they're not a whole lot like that. They're they're a handful, and um, if they're not listed on this list, and again, this is the Georgia DNR list, then we can't send them animals, and we're not we're not going to do that. Um, we're going to put some more information together for you, and and keep adding it. And we're going we're going to try as we find resources, we're going to try and put them up and give them to you, and. You can go as far with this as you want to. Um, and uh, one of the best things that that I think you can get is expensive. It's like 60 or bucks or so. <laughs> but this is called Answering the Call of the Wild, and it's put out by the National Wildlife Rehabilitators Association. This is not for long-term care. This is great for you guys who are going to be volunteering to get an animal from here to there. But more importantly, um, this, when people help me answer the phones for incoming calls, I give them this because one of the best things this does to me is, especially being a former DNR ranger, um, and somebody who grew up with wildlife, um, I found this amazingly comprehensive, uh, not just in Georgia, but this covers the whole country. Um, and they cover the habits of animals and you can use this and usually the information is in there and you can calm someone down that's found a baby deer by itself in the woods and explain, no, you don't need to pick it up and rescue it. That's an abduction. You need to leave it there. Or, you know, there's lots of behavior by other species that people tend to equate a baby animal with a human baby lying in the woods and you just, you can't do that. So, um, I had a phone call while we were preparing uh, from the Atlanta area and a lady was watching a baby deer in the woods 
by her house, and the mother was not too far away, but it was thundering and lightning and raining. And I, I, that breaks my heart too, but you know what? It's a baby deer. It's not a human in the woods, and and that's natural. And um, I told her, you know, if, if, if it floods and, and there's a problem later and it looks like there's a difficulty, then certainly we need to help out. But um, weather and nature and learning to fly and learning to crawl or whatever, that's just part of it. So is there anything else before we wrap up, Dale, that you see? We're going to be going all night if we don't put an end to it. Yeah. I, I, I thank everybody for, for doing this. And please follow up. Make sure your membership's current. If we took a chance and let you in this class, if you didn't pay for the class, please do it. The 20 bucks, I don't think it's – it used to be $40 when Libby did it. <laughs> we were able to cut it in half because we didn't have the expenses of having to rent a place – we did rent this place tonight, but but uh, we didn't have to rent motel rooms for all the instructors. We didn't have to feed them. We didn't have to help them with fuel um, and pay for a lot of the overhead that we had to do when the when we had the traditional in 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 class sessions. Um, so this allowed us to cut that, and we did try and pass it on, and we cut it from forty dollars to twenty dollars. And um, the other courses were all day courses and and this is going to end up being the same way so um it it may be a little bit more that way if you look at it that way but still i i think for what you're going to get from this you're going to see more by video and do things in this class that you never could do in a traditional sit down in person class and the only unfortunate thing is we don't get to all meet in person but i think in the long run it's going to be beneficial and Dale and I have lots of ideas. We're going to, on some of these future sessions, we're going to have people here with us, but we're also going to have people linking up with us by video, and we're going to be able to cut to them and, uh, and do some really cool things. And um, if you have suggestions, um, don't hurt my feelings too bad, <laughs> but send me suggestions and, uh, you know, like your facelift won't, won't be a good one. You know, but, <laughs> but, but, but anything productive, um, send, send us suggestions. And um, like Victoria's idea is something we had already thought of. But, but you know, there are going to be things that with the fundraising in the shirts, but with, with things that. We need a grant writer. Yeah. Yeah. We're working on that too. Um, if, if you know somebody that can uh, help with grants, um, we might find a grant to help with a particular rehabber that's got a project or um, in fundraising in general. If, 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 if you know an animal lover who is capable of supporting, supporting us, please reach out to them and, and we'll be glad to visit them or do whatever we need to do. Or if, if they're in the area of, uh, of a rehabber close by, hook them up with that person. I want to go back and show this map again. There's a lot of empty spaces up there. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the, the area from, uh, well, you can't see the very northern part of Georgia, but there, the northeast corner, Dalton, all the way up toward Chattanooga, that is no man's land. And um, we have some people who are signing up to be volunteers, but there are no rehabbers up there. Um, me, the purpose of me saying that is we need some people really able to recruit. Yeah, we're going to be running something in the 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 Georgia Press Association over the next week about our five year anniversary, and uh, I think that's going to generate some interest. But you look at the coast over there from Savannah down to Jacksonville. There's nothing, no rehabbers. Um, We've got some people training today that have joined us from Brunswick, and that's super helpful. And like I said, Cheryl's there kind of in between uh, Brunswick and Waycross. That's going to be real helpful. Um, yeah, Westcott says she can help with grants. Yeah, okay. There you go. In curriculum. Um, and, and that's, you know, we're, we're looking at doing a lot of things. There's another gap there in the Baxley area and, well, you can, you can see that. I'm going to put a map together. I know that video is hard to see. That's just a map leaning on the chair. I think that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty low tech. <laughs> okay, you can come back here. <laughs>
they like them out, man. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, if you have, uh, let me give you my email. Um, I'll put it up here too, but uh, it's real simple. Um, hopefully, you've got something to write with. If not, I'll talk real slow. Um, it's C Powell all together, lowercase. So it's C P O W E L L at GeorgiaWildlifeRescue.org. And Georgia Wildlife Rescue is all spelled out all lowercase, no dots or spaces. So the whole thing is C Powell at georgiawildliferescue.org, all lowercase, no dots or spaces. And that'll come straight to me. You can inbox me on Facebook. Um, and if you need to, you can call me too. Uh, my, my phone numbers, but we get, I get a lot of incoming wildlife calls and those are going to take precedence. So, um, you know, if I get if I'm talking to you, don't get upset if I say I've got a wildlife call. I'm not just trying to get off the phone with you. But my phone number is 229-546-7143. 229-546-7143. How'd you do that? I'm learning something here. Dale's putting stuff up on the screen. Um, and I guess that's it. Thanks for for jumping on board with us and again please follow up follow through with your membership make sure the class is covered we will keep you posted these things are going to come more frequently and they're going to get better and better not not just in the quality but but in um the people who you're going to be meeting and and, and working with and uh just uh remember again the main thing is we want to save animals, but we've got to do it legally and safely and make sure that, uh, you know, everything's being done correctly. And if you have any questions, just uh, get a hold of me later. And thanks for tuning in. All right. That's a wrap then, right? Yep.